So I think I've mentioned actually the next chapter dives into kind of the more nitty gritty of how a specifics on how a star will live its life depending upon its mass, how quickly it will age, and depending upon its mass, how it will die. Um, and I think you have a homework question for this chapter, chapter 11, that asks you to um, explain if, if stars, if it takes stars so long to live their lives, how do we have a fighting chance of understanding the life cycle of a star? And the answer would be, I think, to me, is that from right here, a snapshot of the sky right now, we have stars that are in so many different stages of their life. Stars up there with so many different masses as they started. Um, and so it's, and that's where the HR diagram comes in. Basically, Hersprung and Russell said, I'm going to take these stars and I'm going to throw them on a scatter plot. This is, and I'm going to look for patterns. And it's those patterns that we can see in the stars. And even though we can't see a star change usually, unless we're lucky, um, we can't see it kind of segue from one stage to another stage. It's such a subtle change, or it takes so long, we can see different stars at different stages in their life. So that's kind of the answer to that one. And an HR diagram is where we, we understand now how a star changes its, its um, luminosity and temperature. And we can understand now the different, um, the stars at the different stages. Um, so uh, we'll talk again kind of about the different stages, but just notice that on the HR diagram, we said that there are giants and supergiants, and they're kind of up in the, the upper right-hand corner. So they would be, what, relatively luminous and cool. And then um, white dwarfs actually are, I might have mentioned already, what, um, I like the term retired stars. White dwarfs then are kind of the, how a star live, um, how a, um, a low mass star ends its life. And the sun will end as a retired star, a white dwarf. And remember on the HR diagram, they are kind of, kind of hot. So they're over here to the left and they have relatively low luminosities. So um, I'm going to go ahead and show this to you. Remember, and I think I've mentioned this before, but as main sequence stars, um, there is this important um, relationship between mass and um, luminosity. So basically right here you see the area arrow going up on the main sequence, and notice that um, as we increase luminosity, increase temperature, we increase mass. And then, I don't know if you can make it out, but kind of circled where the, the giants are and the, the supergiants, notice we don't have that mass-luminosity relationship, nor do we have the mass-luminosity um, relationship down here for the white dwarfs, but it works for the main sequence stars, and there's a, you know, there's a, definitely a reason for that. So, I think we've talked about the two types of clusters before, but I want to talk about, remind you of the two types of clusters of stars out there, and I want to then kind of throw in how we can look at a group of stars, a cluster of stars, on an HR diagram. So the two types of clusters of stars, of course we have open clusters, and this is a photograph of uh, the seven sisters. Aren't they beautiful? There's a little bit of nebulosity. Uh, dust uh, amongst those stars. It's just gorgeous. So this uh, Seven Sisters or the Pleiades, uh, Messier object number 45, uh, it, sometimes people say through binoculars it looks like a little tiny miniature Little Dipper. But anyway, <laughs> so um, this is an example of an open cluster of stars. Now whether it's an open cluster or a globular cluster, that's the other type of cluster, um, these stars were born about the same time. So globular clusters look generally like this. I love globular clusters. They're one of my favorite things to look at in the nighttime sky. Um, both open clusters and globular clusters, remember, that we see through the telescope are associated with the Milky Way galaxy. So um, globular clusters just look three-dimensional to me um, through the telescope. Um, so these stars were born about the same time, too. Notice that you know sometimes they can be really densely packed. So here we go. We're going to take a cluster of stars we're about, well, that were born about the same time, 
and we're going to put them on an HR diagram. And I'm going to go ahead and play this for you. I'm hoping that you remember that the, the massive stars live their lives quickly and die out, whereas the low mass stars live their lives more slowly and take a long time before they uh, leave what we call the main sequence. So um, kind of a little short animation then. We can take this cluster of stars that was born about the same that were born about the same time, and you can kind of see over what blinks out first. So what if we were to take this cluster of stars and throw them up on an HR diagram? Well, here's the an open cluster of stars. This is the Pleiades thrown up on an HR diagram. And um, what's been superimposed for you there are, is the main sequence line. And I'm just kind of focusing on main sequence stars in the Pleiades. And notice that we have, I don't know if you can see it very well, but the little triangles each represent, the little blue triangles each represent a star. Notice that there are no stars here at the upper end. This, por this part right here on the main sequence is what we call the turnoff point. And we can gauge the age of that group of stars by where the turnoff point is. The lower down, um, the lighter, the lower down here on the main sequence the turnoff point is, the older this group of stars is. If the turnoff point is way up here, then that means that group of stars is relatively young. So here are, um, it's kind of a busy slide, but here are four clusters and they're of stars. And you can look, they have, they have four different turnoff points. And the, 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 the youngest group of stars up here are indicated by kind of these purple triangles here. And it has, these are only 14 million years old, <laughs> just babies. And it has a really high turnoff point. And that means that there are not very many massive stars that have left the main sequence. If we go contrast that to down here, if you look at kind of the um, uh, NGC 188, where you see the squares, the yellow squares, or peach cover, colored squares, you see the turnoff point is clear down here. That means that there was enough time for all of these stars to leave the main sequence. And so this is dated actually at 7 billion years old, this group of stars. Okay, so the turnoff point Turnoff point is an important um, aspect of a, a cluster of stars, and it indicates how old the cluster of stars are in general. So let me show you this one. All these applets, if you have uh, Mastering Astronomy, um, which I'm hearing good things about Mastering Astronomy, um, you should have access to these cute little applets. So I'm going to start the clock going. And notice that these high mass stars at the upper left hand corner of the uh, main sequence go first. So the turnoff point is clear down here. I'm going to play it again. Notice that this would date this cluster of stars about 10 billion years. That's pretty cool. So just to kind of um, finish up then, as it turns out, the, the globular clusters that I love to look at in the nighttime sky so much, I look three-dimensional, globular clusters are, are very old. Globular clusters of stars, those stars are very old. They date back to um, pushing the, the Big Bang, 13 billion years old. So um, to kind of put this in perspective, by the way, this is a um, this is showing you the turnoff point of a globular cluster of stars. Notice that our sun um, would have been started to kind of leave the the um, the main sequence at this age.